Hi, AP Stat students. Today we're going to talk about the Unit 6 one sample Z interval and one sample Z test for P. Tomorrow we'll cover the two sample Z interval and Z test for P1 minus P2. Now today will be longer. It will probably be the last long video that I'll have for quite some time because not only do I have to talk about the interval and the test, but I have to talk about these very important terms that come with it. Now, starting tomorrow and the rest of the days, I won't have to keep, remi I'll remind you, but I won't have to keep talking about it so much. So just be prepared that today is a little bit longer, but after today, I'll try to make the videos much shorter. Okay, I hope everyone's having a great day. Um, please watch till the very end for a fun fact about Mr. Opal. I'm gonna have this week be fun fact week. So tom tomorrow then I'll do one about Anders and Annika and I'll lastly do one about myself. So let's get started. Unit six Z interval test, um, Z interval or test for P. Let's just first talk about the difference. Okay, I guarantee, I, I don't wanna say guarantee, but I'm really feeling strongly that you're gonna have both an interval on the test for this year's 2020 exam, okay? You have two questions. I really believe one of them will be a test and one of them will have an interval on that, okay? With that being said, how do I know when to do an interval and how do I know when to do a test? I get that question all the time. It will state, find a 95% confidence interval. If it doesn't state, find a 95% confidence interval, it might not say test. It might say, do we have significant evidence for something? Now, remember, these are called significance tests, okay? And But they might not say perform a significance test. They may just say, do we have significant evidence? Or they might just say, do we have evidence? Usually they give you an alpha level in my experience. If they don't, choose an alpha level of 0 0.05, okay? Okay, now, if you are asked to perform an interval, make sure you know how to compete, compute that interval. State, plan, do, conclude, okay? The first thing with an interval, when we state, if we're dealing with a proportion, P is equal to the true proportion. Now, one question I get is, how do I know if it's a proportion or a mean? A proportion is a categorical variable, okay? It also, for a mean, for a T interval or a T test, it will say the word mean in the problem, in the stem of the problem. It will not say it for a proportion, okay? Usually you'll get that part out of a total sample. So it will say out of the 100 people sampled, 60 of them are going to the U of M, okay? So let's go with that U of M uh, example. Okay, let's say we are trying to find the true proportion of high school students who are going to the U of M. You need to have it in context here, okay, when you're talking about that true proportion. Next is the plan, the RIN. What does R stand for? R is a random sample, okay? We have a random sample of N is equal to 100 because we're talking about the U of M. I, that's your 10% condition. Now, Really clear, in case you were asked, the independence condition is tied to the standard deviation. Once we pass that independence condition, that means we are allowed to use that standard deviation. Now, in this case, it is actually called a standard error, okay? Because you're not using the actual P, the actual parameter. What's a parameter? Because it's been a while, a parameter is describing the entire population. With an interval, we don't know what's describing the entire population. We don't know the actual percentage of people going to the U of M. So we have to estimate it. And we do that to find an interval. We find a lower bound and an upper bound, which gives us very plausible valuable values for the truth about that population. So when we do our, our I, okay, we do 10 times N has to be less than capital N. 10 times lowercase n has to be less than capital N. Hopefully you can see that. All right, what is little n? n is your sample size, capital N is your population size, and oftentimes we don't know that, 
And so we would just say all high school students, okay? Then we get into the N. This is the one that people mess up the most. This is your N times P it has to be greater than or equal to 10. And N times one minus P has to be greater than or equal to 10. Okay, there it is. Hopefully you can see that. Now, here's the catch, guys. We don't know P, right? I just talked about why we don't know. We're trying to estimate P. So we use P hats, okay? So in that case, we're going to use 60 over 100 for that N, okay? And then in that plan, we have to use the method. So we met our condition. Now what measurement tool are we going to use? That's that one sample Z interval for P, okay? Do. We're on the do part. You want to write your formula out, okay? You want to plug in your p hat. So in this case, it would be 0.6, right? Plus or minus your z star. How do I find our z star? I have to go to my formula sheet. I'm going to pause the video real quick. I'm going to pull that up so I can show it to you. Okay, so I have my formula sheet here. I'm going to scroll down to not the z, but actually the t. That's where I find all my critical values. So if I was doing a 95% confidence interval, I'm gonna use 1.96. If I was finding a 99% confidence interval, I'm doing 2.576. Okay, so with that being said, we would plug in, if I'm doing a 95%, that would be 1.96. So I'm gonna do it on my pink paper. I'll show you here in a second. So I said 60 out of 100 we found, so that's 0.6 plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of 0 0.6 times 1 minus 0 0.6 all over n, okay? And where does that come from? Let me go back to my key concepts here. That's right here. So that comes right here. So that's what I'm gonna plug in to my calculator. And I wanna be very careful how I plug that in. Now, if you have a graphing calculator, let me remind you how you would plug that into your graphing calculator. Okay, so let's go to that. I'm gonna go to stat. I'm gonna arrow over to tests, okay? I'm gonna go to one prop, Z interval, which is right there, letter A for me. I'm gonna hit enter. Excuse me, enter, okay? And there's my X, that's my part. Now, common mistake, sometimes people put a decimal there because they already figured it out. No, that's your P hat. You wanna put 60, you wanna go to 100, and you wanna calculate. Now, there you go. Now, you will not receive full credit if you just put that interval, okay? You must show your work like I showed you in the pink. Okay, now, next thing, conclude. I am 95% confident that the interval from 0 0.50398 to 0 0.69602 contains the true proportion of students going to the U of M. Okay, next, you're only having two problems on this year's test, this 2020 test, okay, the year 2020. You, and even if it's not 2020, we're watching it in the future, okay? What can happen is there can be a follow-up question with an interval. One type of follow-up question could be interpret the confidence level, okay? Interpret the level. When we interpret the level, this must be written down on your notes. It is imperative that you write this down. I can foresee this coming, that they will ask you to interpret a level and ask you to interpret a p-value, okay? Interpreting a level is right here. So we would say in this case, with this context, we'd say, in 95% of all possible samples of n equals 100, this method would result in an interval that captures the true proportion of students who are going to the U of M, okay? That must be written down. Pause the video right now, write that down, take a little break if you need to, and come on back. Okay. Another thing that might be asked when it comes to the interval is saying, oh, that interval's a little wide. There's a little bit of variation there that we don't like, but we want to keep our confidence level, okay? Because what happens when we increase our confidence level, the variation increases as well. 
Why is that? Because that Z star that we talked about right there, that increases. Let's see if I'm pointing to it right. That increases. So if you go back and you look, if it's a 99%, that Z star is higher. So we want to keep it at 95%, but we want to decrease our variation. What do we have to do? We need to increase our sample size. In fact, guys, if I had a printer at home, I'd want to print this. I don't own a printer, okay? But if I had one and I was a student, I'd want to print this. If I don't own a printer, okay, I would write it down. And I think there's a lot of value in writing it down because there's something that happens when you're writing and goes to your brain, okay? All right. Another thing that could happen is when it comes to intervals, they could ask you, well, I, I want to do a new interval, okay? I didn't like my margin of error. What is the margin of error in case you're asking? That margin of error, okay, if they ask you to just find the margin of error, you're calculating just this piece right here, okay? Now, there, it is very, very plausible. I've seen it in the past, okay, where they say, oh, I want to um, have a margin of error this time of 3%, okay? Uh, what sample size should I use if I still want 95%, okay? So then what you need to do here is we know our margin of error is equal to Z star times our standard deviation, okay? Usually, we always use 0.5 as a conservative estimate. You can always do that for credit, so I'm going to tell you to do that now, okay? Unless for some reason they would tell you to use 0.6, like the U of M example that we're talking about right now, okay? But I personally would just use 0.5 it's, and say it's my conservative estimate and that's okay, okay? You would never be docked for that. So I'm gonna write it on my pink little notepad here. Um, I have 0 0.03 because that's my margin of error. Now they're not gonna say 0 0.03, they're gonna say, now let me just rewind in case you're, I'm losing you. It is plausible you could get a question where they say, hey, we want a margin of error of 3%, okay? How many people should we sample if we want a margin of error of 3%? So you take your margin of error formula, your margin of error is equal to Z star times the square, your standard deviation, which is right here. Margin of error is equal to Z star times the standard deviation. 3% is 0 0.03 is a decimal, okay? Then you go, I have 95%, so you need to make sure you have that right Z star from the table and how you get that. Okay, so 1.96, I have that memorized. And then that P I'm going to use is that conservative estimate, always, 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 1 minus 0.5 over N. This is pink, okay? You plug it in. You use algebra. If you're, like, blanking on algebra, don't forget, okay? You're going to divide by 1.96 first. So 0 0.03 divided by 1.96. You're going to square both sides, and then you can cross multiply to do the rest. Okay, the last thing with an interval, you guys, is you want to make sure that you're able to answer a follow-up question. A follow-up question might be a professor from the U of M. He really believes that 75% of Minnesota teens go to the U of M. How would you respond? Okay, you would say, I don't agree with the professor because my 95% confidence interval does not include the value 75%, okay? In order to get credit, you have to state my 95% interval or whatever percent you use. And then you have to talk about the interval does or does not contain that value. Now, if the U of M professor said, I believe 65% of Minnesota, Minnesota teens go to the U of M. How would you respond? You would respond, that is a plausible belief. Why? Because my 95% confidence interval does contain 65%. So we do have evidence that it could be 65%. Okay, I'm done with the intervals. Let's move on to the tests. At this point, we're 14 minutes in. If you need to take a quick break, you go ahead and do that. Just know, okay, just know that please come back. You need to, need to, need to hear about the fun fact about Mr. Opal. Okay, hopefully you're back. Um, this is going a little faster, actually, than, than I had hoped. I was thinking it's going to be a lot longer. 
I am going to go a little bit faster through the test, but I'll be writing on my pink pad as well. And then the type one and the type two errors, that video is actually going to come on Wednesday. Okay. So, um, we're, we're good with that right now. I'll quickly briefly talk about it, but don't worry about it. I'm certain that will be on the test as well. I shouldn't say I'm certain. I'm just trying to envision with, you know, what's going to happen on these two question tests for this year. Um, and, and it's an important piece in, in all statistics. So uh, we can talk about that later though. So let's get going on the test. Okay. So the difference with the test is the test is going to ask, you know, do we have significant evidence? I need to pause real quick. One second. Okay. So we're back right now. We're going to talk about the significance test, the one sample Z test for P the test state plan to conclude H O H A P is equal to the true proportion. Let's again run with this whole idea so you can have some context. Um, let's go back to that professor thinking he thinks 75% of Minnesota teens go to the U of M. You call fall. You're like, no way, can't be that high. You go out, you do find a random sample of 100 people. You ask them, are they going to the U of M? 60 of the 100 are going to the U of M. So right now you have evidence that 75% might be a little high. OK, but you need to see if do we have significant evidence, right? Do we have significance? So what do we have? We have a null and we have an alternative. So if the the null is always either the current truth, OK, or a claim. So in this case, the professor is, is coming up with a claim. OK, um, typically on the EP, it's going to be a current truth that's already stated. Like this is what we believe. So. Our HO then here would be P is equal to 0.6. Our HA would be, hey, we think that, I'm sorry, not 0.6. That's a real common mistake actually that I just made. 0.6 is 60 out of 100 said, yeah, they're going to the U of M, okay, right? But that's our statistic. That's describing the sample, okay? That's P hat. The parameter P, okay? That's describing the population. And the professor is describing the population and he's saying it's 75%. And we think it's less than that, okay? So we go ahead and we make our null and our alternative hypotheses, right? Okay, so from there then, you also need to make sure you state your parameter, P is equal to the true proportion of Minnesota teens who are going to the U of M. And you have to pick an alpha level if they don't give it to you. If they give it to you, you just fill it in there. And the standard alpha level is 0 0.05. I'm not going to discuss the conditions again because they're the exact same conditions as the plan, with the exception of the normal condition. With that normal condition, you still, let's see, where did it go? Use that NP, right? Can you see it there? Yeah. Our NP is greater than or equal to 10, and N times 1 minus P is greater than or equal to 10, okay? So this time you do not use P hat. You only use P hat there when you don't know P hat. Okay, so we're good with the conditions. Our method, we're good at one sample Z test for P. That saves us some time so we can get right into the do. Is a picture necessary? No, it absolutely is not necessary. However, I tell my students it's insurance. They are grading you holistically, which means if you make a tiny little mistake, but everything else looks beautiful and you're really showing a clear understanding of statistics, which is a picture that's marked out accurately, they may bump you from a three and a half to a four. They may bump you up. OK, so I'm going to quickly draw my picture. And when you look at that picture there, the P always goes in the center. That's that that claim. So that 0.75, whatever is describing the population right now. And then we get a P hat, and that's what you find. Okay, so our P hat was 0.6. So I'm just gonna pick an arbitrary point. It doesn't matter too much. Okay, obviously you don't want it right next to it. You know, you wanna use your, your math a little bit to kind of envision, okay? And then we have that standard deviation. So that's that 0.6 times one minus 0.6 divided by 100. This is all based off the story I'm telling you right now, okay? So there's no problem up here. If you're like, where should you get in those numbers? Remember, just like I do in class, I'll tell stories sometimes to teach. Do you guys remember the story about the mixer, Mr. Opal and the mixer, unit three, first semester? Okay, so now, um, so I have this 0.6 here. 
I lied, not 0.6. You guys, I made that common mistake again. A very common mistake is what people will do is they will put the P hat in that standard deviation. That is not okay, okay? You must use your P, okay? You must use the parameter. So the parameter right now is that 0.75 because the professor, he's describing all Minnesota, Minnesota teens. 0.6 is describing just 100 people we sample. Okay, so I'm putting 0.75 in times 1 minus 0.75 all over 100. So here's what my picture looks like. Okay, now next what I need is I need my Z score. Okay, so I go to my Z, that's my ZOMS, what I observed, my P hat is what I observed. Okay, so 0.6 minus my mean, so that mean of the distribution is right there, that P. Okay, so that's 0.75 divided by my standard deviation. And at this point, you can go right to the calculator, okay? And if you don't have a graphing calculator, I'll quickly talk about how you can do it without the graphing calculator. But you can see I already set it up. I'm going to go to stat. I'm going to go over to tests. I'm going to go to one prop Z test, okay? So that's right there, number five. I'm going to put 0.75 in for P not, which means the null hypothesis, whatever your parameter was. X is 60, what I found, N is 100. So I found 60 out of 100 people are going to the U of M. And I have a less than because I don't think this professor is right, okay? I go ahead and I go down and I calculate. And there I get my Z score. And my Z score is negative 3.46, okay? With a P value of 0. 0.000. Three. Now, be very careful, you guys. Some people, they get really hurried, and they write down that the p-value is 0.266. There's that scientific notation there. Don't make that mistake. Okay, what if you don't have a graphing calculator? You go to your z-chart. You know that, you because you can calculate this by hand. You know that your z-score is negative 3.46. So negative 3.46, and there you go. There's your p-value. Okay, now keep in mind if you're doing it by hand, if it's a greater than, okay? If it's a greater than problem, whoopsie. So you're in the positive Z scores here. Write this down. Pause this and write this down after I say it. You need to remember to do one minus this P value, okay? Second thing, if it is an HA, an alternative hypothesis that is not equal to, okay? You need to make sure you find the right p-value. So if it's a positive z-score, you need to subtract from one. If it's a negative z-score, you don't. But at the end, you have to multiply by two. Please message me privately if that does not make sense to you, okay? I can make a little video over that, just a little five minute video. One question that comes up is, how do I know if it's a less than, a greater than, or a not equal in the alternative? Look for the words. If it just says test to see if there's a difference, that's a not equal to in your HA. In this case, we cried foul. We thought that professor's parameter, whatever, however he got that, was way too high. So we think it's less than, okay? So just be looking for those words. It will be clear. It should be. They're not, those AP, the college board's not trying to trick you here, okay? Let's go back to the one pager and finish up. We're almost done. You guys are doing great. Okay, so um, definitely, definitely, definitely write this down here. You're going to pause after I say it. I can for certain think that interpreting the p-value could be on there. Let's rewind though. Before I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we interpret that p-value, let's talk about concluding, okay? If the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. We have evidence for HA. When the p-value is low, you reject the HO. If the p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning we have no evidence for HA. This must be in context. So when you conclude, I say, because my p-value is less than alpha, I reject the null hypothesis, period. I have evidence, the true proportion, okay, the true proportion, of high school se seniors who are going to attend the U of M is less than 0.75. So I'm taking that alternative right there 
and I'm stating it in context, I have evidence that the true proportion of high school seniors going to the U of M is less than 0.75, period. Part C, part D, whatever part, they may say interpret the p-value from the previous part, okay? So here I said, well, we can actually do it for us, okay? Our p-value, so the p-value of 0 0.003 means you don't have to change it to a probability. You could just say, this is the chance of calculating a statistic as extreme or more extreme than what we calculated. I'm not gonna say than what we calculated. I'm gonna say a statistic as extreme or more extreme than 0.6, because that was our statistic. That was our P hat. Here's the catch though. If you do not put this next part, you'll be docked. Given the null hypothesis is true. So that means you have to state that in context. Given the true proportion of high school seniors who are going to the U of M is equal to 0.75. Write that down, make sure you can do it on your own. What would it look like? The p-value is 0.0003. It means this is the chance of calculating a statistic of 0.6 or more extreme than that, given the true proportion of teens who are going to the U of M is equal to 0.75. Okay, let me know if you have any questions on that. Okay, type one or type two errors, power. I will have a video for that, not tomorrow. Tomorrow we're gonna do the two sample, okay? But I'll have a video for you on that for, see, tomorrow, um, Thursday it will be, Thursday. Okay, you guys, we're making it under 30 minutes. Make sure you check out the rest of um, this here. This is just talking about becoming one with your calculator. I practiced that with you. Um, you can read about the type one, type two errors if you like. Um, and then just know too, this using an interval to reject or fail to reject that, read that as well, okay? I just talked about that. So if the blank percent interval contains the parameter, you can fail to reject. I know I'm not suspecting this will be on the test. It's more about what I talked about earlier. You find it in interval, then they have a follow-up question and this, like I talked about earlier. So I wouldn't worry about this box too much. If you're looking at that and you're thinking, oh, I don't know, don't worry about it. Just make sure you hung on to the other things that I talked about. Okay, guys, this is the time. Fun fact time. Fun fact about Mr. Opal. Mr. Opal is an identical twin. Pretty fun, huh? Okay. All right, you guys have a great day and let me know if you have any questions.